How's the weather for us? Morning. Hello, How are you doing? You too. Good, thanks. How are you? Very well, thank you. Hoping Good. that it's not so blustery this weekend. Well, unfortunately, that situation is going to stay with us, but only for now. There's okay. a change on the way. So we've seen gusts of 60, 70, up to 99 miles per hour, actually, on the Isle of Wight uh, overnight. And we're seeing those big waves along coastal parts. Now, we're probably going to hang on to that today and tomorrow. That's how it's looking both. Thanks very much, Owen. Thank you. It is 13 minutes past nine Saturday morning. So you may have seen there's some speculation that we might all be offered a COVID vaccine earlier, possibly, than expected. Let's take a look at that issue and also try to answer some of your questions that you send in with the help of our regular Saturday morning team. Got the virologist, Dr Chris Smith, and Professor of morning. Public Health, Linda Bold. Good morning to you both. Morning. 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 Linda, I'm sorry, I'm going straight in. You, I mean, you've stepped it up. Can we just take a closer look at what's going on behind you here? Well, you know, it's an important day tomorrow, Naga, isn't it? It's Mother's Day. So uh, my 18-year-old son, my 16-year-old daughter, we had a discussion after last week's, uh, after we saw George, George the Cactus last week. <laughs> it was huge. And I said, look, he was huge. It was it was frightening for for many people who saw that. So we so we had a chat, and um, I said, look, just anything with a cactus, just see what you can come up. So this is a throw. I think you're supposed to put it over a sofa or something. So it's just to sort of channel. We all wish we were somewhere warm where the sun was shining in a lovely garden. So that's where I am at the moment. The only problem is I can't now get out of this room because I've taped it over the door. But so it's a te it's a temporary thing. But I hope you like it. I'm gonna I'm gonna make a completely unfair decision, and I'm not gonna give. Uh, uh, Dr. Chris Smith, the right of reply on the basis that it's Mother's Day. And so that's it. It's just it's, the gauntlet is laid down. You don't get to say anything about it, Chris. not been evidence. But what's the picture you're seeing? I think we're making really excellent progress. I mean, over a third of the UK's population have had their, or almost four in 10, have had their first dose. Uh, we're still uh, lagging behind Israel and United Arab Emirates, but I think we're sort of third in the league table, not that it is a competition, I emphasize. So it's going generally well, although there are some issues to think about. Supply, particularly of the Pfizer-BioNTech vaccine, has been an issue in recent weeks. And up here in Scotland, you know, we were aiming for 400,000 doses a week, and we're nowhere near that at the moment because of supply issues. And there's been things with people losing their letters, etc. So I think we need to be cautious about saying, you know, we're all going to get it before we were intended to, which for the top nine priority groups set out by the JCVI uh, is during the month of July. I think we will get there. I would be surprised if it was much ahead of that, but it is going extremely well. And I know you were speaking to Dr. Sarah Jarvis earlier and GPs, pharmacists and these mass vaccination centres are really doing a, a phenomenal public service for all of us. Chris, just I suppose this all comes about, you know, what what does it mean having the vaccine? So he wants the detail. Does 80 percent efficacy mean that 80 percent of people won't get COVID or 80 percent might get it, but not seriously? It all depends on what question was asked in the trial. And in the trial, what in the most part they're asking was, can we prevent severe disease or death? And that's what the eth efficacy values refer to. And specifically, if you've got an efficacy of, he says, 80 percent, some some of the trials showed 90, 95 percent. What that means is that out of 100 people who got the vaccine, if they were exposed to coronavirus, 95 percent of them would be expected to be protected from severe disease. But what's now emerging and because it wasn't part of the trials, we're slowly learning this actually on the ground as the vaccines roll out is that they do also prevent people from catching the infection full stop. There was a very interesting data set released from Cambridge University's team has enabled us to use the vaccines to stop the infection spreading. And that probably is contributing to the fact that rates are coming right down across the country. Linda, a question for you from Alison, uh, who's in Harrow. Uh, and this is relevant, of course, because more and more people week on week uh, will have had the first dose. I've had the first dose of the AstraZeneca vaccine. If I get coronavirus symptoms, do I need to get a test? So the short answer, Charlie, is yes. So there's a couple of things there that it's important to recognize. First of all, the vaccines are not 100% effective. Uh, so even though we're seeing really encouraging results, both in relation to reductions in hospitalization and mortality, and Chris is saying uh, results now from at least three studies that show reduction in transmission, um, we don't know whether it will provide full protection. So in receiving your first dose of the vaccine and getting full protection, which is really only delivered about a week to two weeks after the second dose, 
Data on protection after the first dose, after a couple of weeks varies, could be 70, even 80% in some cases, but there's still that gap. So it's important that if somebody does develop symptoms, they can't come forward and, and get a test. More frequently, so what, one, two, every five years? Well, for now, of course, we're, we're following the protocol that was laid down in the trials, which were that people should receive two doses, although Johnson & Johnson's vaccine, made by Janssen, which has come out and been approved this week by the European Medicines Agency as well, that is a, a one-shot vaccine. Now, what we would hope is that uh, these things would be so successful that coronavirus would disappear and we'd never have to worry again. But we know that's not going to be the case. We know this is almost certainly going to become an endemic infection, which will circulate at least for the foreseeable future. And therefore, we have to factor into our vaccination plans the fact that it will be with us alongside us for a while. We also know that the immunity that we get against either infection with coronaviruses of, of, of all types and also vaccination it isn't permanent. It doesn't produce a lifelong permanent immune protection. And remember, this is a moving target. The virus is evolving all the time. We're seeing the emergence of these variants. For that reason, what we foresee is some kind of vaccine program that will probably be very similar to how we handle flu, because flu is also a moving target. And the WHO scrutinise what the flu is up to around the world every year, and they update the vaccine accordingly. Well, Linda, with your public health head on, if there is, say, an annual revaccination or a booster, in terms of practical practicalities, I mean, when you think about the flu, it's for a certain percentage of the population in a certain vulnerable bracket. This is a much wider... Well, it's everyone. It's everyone from the age of... Everybody over the age of 18 or even children again. It may be that we, as we accumulate more evidence over time around the protection from vaccination, um, we determine that it might only be older and more vulnerable groups, as with the influenza vaccination programme, that we need to revaccinate. We also know that the, a COVID-19 vaccine in future could be administered at the same time as a flu jab. That's a possibility. Uh, we know from uh, the Green Book that that is, um, at the moment, that that is permitted. So I think it will be a big undertaking. We don't know whether it will be everybody. However, given the experience that we've had this year um, with doing this at scale, it is the type of thing that could be planned for. Whether from a behavioural perspective, we would see the coming forward and people taking it up at the very high levels we've had this year, I'd be a bit more sceptical. Can I ask you for a thought on uh, schools? Because this time last week, of course, we were looking ahead to, you know, the, the sort of effectively the full reality opening of schools, I know. Not really. So Denmark, the primary schools went back uh, at the beginning of February and the, they've remained open. There was one area where they had to close again, I think due to an outbreak just in one municipality, not directly linked to schools. In Scotland, we've had the primary school children and also part time some of the um, final years back for uh, two weeks now. And we've not really seen numbers rising. They're not declining significantly here. But we've not seen outbreaks particularly linked to schools, but it does take a bit more time. The the big shift in England is that you've had all pupils going back on March the 8th. That's a big undertaking, a lot of people moving around. And even with, you know, the, the lateral flow testing, which is a bit controversial in terms of how it's been administered, we don't know what will happen. So I imagine the full impact of schools will still not be seen in the UK for, for a couple of weeks in England. I had a thought for you, I mean, whether or not they're supposed to be, I think a lot of people are thinking about whether they can go away at some point. And maybe they're looking at a map wistfully thinking, oh, maybe I'll go to, I don't know, France or Italy, Europe particularly? Well, of course, the difference between the other parts of Europe and our country is that now one in three adults has been vaccinated in our country. So the plans that we can make in the future for holidaying here in the UK or how we ease our lockdown will obviously be a bit different from what could be planned across Europe because the rates of vaccination there are much lower. And as we have been discussing in the programme so far, we know that not only are we protecting people from severe disease and possibly death with these vaccines, we're also helping to stop transmission as well. So we can foresee that before too long, we're going to have very low levels of, of virus circulation, but we'll also have very low levels of impact of that virus circulation. But it's a much less certain entity overseas. And also, we, we don't know what's going to happen with these vaccine passports. It may well be that countries, because they're desperate for, for us to go and spend our British pounds on their shores, some countries may well say, well, we want vaccination passports. So hopefully by the time uh, that, that people are in a position to start making travel decisions, actually most people here will have been vaccinated, which will put us in a very strong position in terms of being able to, to get some very good deals on holidays. Because Charlie, you did promise, um, well, Charlie, Charlie shut you down this week.
Chris. Yeah, he uh, did. Yeah, he did. <laughs> <laughs> Do you know, now, Please now you're saying so sad. Oh, now, now you make me feel bad. Yeah, well, look at what you... Yeah, Do you want a moment? Do you, oh, all right, then. Anything you want to say, Chris? Well, no, I, I, I did anticipate <laughs> that Linda might pull something out of the hat, oh, here actually. here we go. And, and so, yes, I maxed out on the cactus front, so I'm going to branch out, if you'll excuse, excuse the sort of plant-related pun, in a different direction, because I've got something quite interesting. I've got a Venus flytrap. Yay. Now, these come from the Carolinas, and this has borrowed this off my son, but look at this. They do flower, and this one is about to. I was hoping it would flower for this week so I could max out in two directions, both flowers and a totally different type of plant, a carnivorous plant, but they actually grow from a bulb but they will make flowers that make little seeds. So I'm going to let this one flower and see if I can spawn some more Venus flytraps. But there we go. I, th I thought we'd go into the carnivorous plant direction from a cactus direction last week. OK. Um, I, hope Chris I hope there's no flies um, there, because I'd feel sorry for the Linda, flies. there are no flies on me. <laughs> boom, boom. <laughs> boom, boom. You can see that up. one coming yeah. a mile off. What a duo. <laughs> Chris, Linda, always good to Thank have you. you with us. I'm um, going through the questions. And with your competitive nature, of course. Thank you. And as always, thank you for getting in touch. Uh, yes. Because it's often... The thing about these questions, so often is the case, if you're thinking it, yeah. someone else is thinking of it course. too. So it's always worthwhile. 9.28, the time now. Uh, 31, let's bring you up to date with the main stories. A police officer is due in court. <laughs> I didn't know that. Yeah, it's called a Le Crunch. Yeah, well, we talked about Le Crunch, didn't we, at half past eight. This Enjoy your weekend. And time let's now. see. Yes, yeah, sorry, time now is 9.41. Today marks 25 years since 16 children and their teacher were killed.